Psychology uh, Summer Session. Um, I'm Bruce Bradway here. This is me right here. Uh, I do have a doctorate uh, in psychology. <clears throat> um, so we're going to tackle social psychology. One of the things you need to, to uh, well, you know, <laughs> this is that big a deal, but uh, I haven't taught this class in a couple of years. Uh, we have another uh, faculty member that normally teaches this class, uh, but I'm going to teach it over the summer. I, I taught it for ever, uh, up until a couple of years ago, and then she uh, indicated that she would rather teach the class, or she wanted to teach this class, and so there you go. That's, that's the way it works sometimes. Uh, one of the things that I need to explain to you right now uh, I just started reading a book called uh, Left-Handed uh, Son of Old Man Hat. Yeah, Son of Old Man Hat. Uh, so some of my discussion questions are a little bit uh, interesting. Um, uh, so uh, that's the reason why. Uh, if, if, these, if you feel like these are too intrusive, uh, I always give you an option as to what uh, or what uh, discussion question you uh, you can answer. Uh, just to answer the other question and and drop me an email and say, hey, I don't think you should be asking these kinds of questions. But uh, yeah, a lot of it has to do with <laughs> with this book I'm reading, uh, Left Handed. I don't know if you've ever read the book before, but it's really kind of fascinating. Uh, evidently, uh, Left Handed. Uh, uh, was a was went to Fort Sumner with his mother when he was a, when he was uh, very young, um, and so this is the he talks about the time right after they came back from Fort Sumner uh, when he was old enough to think about things, um, and it's really kind of fascinating. Uh, it is this so far. I'm not very far into it. I think I'm only on page twenty six. 27. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I, I'll probably be talking about this book for, for the next uh, uh, week or so, a couple weeks. Anyway, so today we're going to tackle chapter one and chapter two. Chapter one is the introduction to social psychology, where we explain what social psychology is. And then chapter two has to do with research uh, in social psychology. So let's go ahead and get started. Let me turn this thing on. There we go. Uh, so once upon a time, there was a young lady who was treated very badly by her evil stepmother. She wasn't allowed to wear makeup or go to any of the local parties. One day after she was uh, once again disappointed about a ball, her fairy godmother came to her and dolled her up for the party. And this is what she looked like before, and that's what she looked like afterwards. She went to the ball and no one in her family recognized her because that's the way she normally looked and this is the way she looked at the party. Uh, the prince saw her and fell immediately in love with her, but she had to leave the party early before all the magic wore off, her hair, makeup, clothes, and transportation and whatnot. But she left be behind a glass slipper that the prince found. Now you may recognize this story. And has a different ending. The prince went around the land looking for someone to fit the slipper. He found three women who had the same size foot, but he didn't recognize any of them as the woman that he danced with at the ball. Uh, when he found the young lady in her house, she cowered and seemed meek, certainly not the self-assured woman from the ball. Which woman did, you, did uh, he choose for his bride? So that's the question. Which one did he choose? Which one would you choose if you were the prince? And if you said that you would choose her, well, that's not, that's not an option. Uh, just before he was about to choose one of the dark-haired women, the young lady's fairy godmother performed a miracle, and she turned into the woman the prince had fallen in love with at the ball. Not only did she look like a dreamboat, but she began walking and talking with more self-assurance. The prince immediately chose her for his princess. However, the fairy godmother was a bit of a trickster, and just as the prince was saying his final I do's, the fairy godmother changed the young lady back into what she looked like before the miraculous transformation. 
The fairy godmother then cussed the prince out for being so superficial and not recognizing her from her inner beauty instead of her outward appearance. The prince replied that he would have seen through her appearance if she had acted the same way she had acted at the ball. And this has a lot to do with context. So this is what she looks like at home, but that's what she looks like at the ball. So this is this is context. So if you've ever been if you've ever gone to a grocery store and not recognized somebody who you normally see in a different context, like uh, at school or whatever, and you don't really recognize them because they're not in the proper context, now you understand why, what the prince was complaining about. There, this lady was in a different context. That's the way she looked. How in the world was he supposed to see this person in that person? Jean-Paul Sartre was a French philosopher who stated, we cannot be distinguished from our situations, for they form us and decide our possibilities. So no matter where you are, no matter what is going on, you are where you are. Herman Melville stated that our lives are connected by a thousand invisible threads. It is these invisible threads that social psychology tries to illuminate. Uh, the reality is you are everything. The, the person that you are uh, is the, the individual that has gone through ever, all of your life experiences. And if one of those life experiences had changed, then potentially you, are a, you would be a different person than you are today. And that's one of the things that you need to, uh, to, to recognize in your own life. No matter what you've done, no matter what has happened to you, uh, the person that you are today is the person that, um, uh, that experienced all of those things. So if you hadn't experienced one thing or another thing, if somebody hadn't died, if, some, if you hadn't gone to, uh, uh, if you hadn't played basketball when you were in high school, um, uh, a good, good example out of my own life, I ran track in college. If I hadn't run track, I probably would have dropped out of college my freshman year. But because I was running track and because I was, I was very successful uh, at running track, I continued at the institution. Um, and a lot of times it was just track that keep, kept me going to college. And of course, I got my bachelor's degree. Then while I was in the military, I, I uh, was able to, to uh, get two, two master's degrees and an associate's degree. Uh, once I got out uh, my military experience, um, the GI Bill paid for my PhD, or at least put, paid for the first part of my PhD. Fiorina and Todd have uh, been happily married for three years. Uh, last Thursday, Fiorina got a, got a really mean tone in her voice and said shrewishly uh, to Todd, can't you ever put the cat back on the toothpaste? Todd assumed that Fiorina must have had a bad drive home from work. The problem, of course, was external. It wasn't the fact that she's, she's a mean shrew uh, trying to make him put the cat back on the, the toothpaste. The only reason she's mentioning it is because she had a bad day. Something external happened to her, and it made her the way that she is. Fitch and Bodie fought before they were married and had been unhappily sparring through three years of marriage. One day, Fitch said to Bodie, can't you ever put the top back on the toothpaste? Bodie thought to himself self, as he put the top back on the toothpaste, what is the word for someone who is unpleasant and always hostile? Oh yeah, Fitch. Later at dinner, Fitch asked Bodie uh, if the dinner was okay. He blew up anticipating a fight. Uh, so as you can see, uh, it, it, everything has to do with context. Fitch and Bodie are used to fighting, so anytime someone asks the other one a question, they assume it, it is because they are, they are trying to get into a fight. As far as Furina and Todd were concerned, totally different situation. Social psychology is a scientific study of how people think about, influence, and relate to one another. Social psychology studies uh, how we are, as individuals, are influenced by other people. Uh, social psychology was defined by Gordon Allport. Uh, thoughts are affected by actual presence of others. Uh, feelings are affected by uh, imagined presence of others. Behavior is affected by implied presence 
of others. We always anticipate that other people uh, are, care about what's happening to us or care about what's going on. And because we think of other people, we're not completely narcissistic, uh, we're, we're not completely wrapped up in our own egos, uh, that is uh, how we react to situations. We react to situations uh, in context with other individuals. What is the difference between social psychology and sociology? Both fields are interested in social behavior. Psychology focus on, focuses on individual level variables, the thought processes that we have, the emotional reactions we have, the behavioral tendencies we have. Sociology focuses on group level variables, status norms, and social roles. So psychology looks at the individual in a social setting. So sociology looks uh, at groups or group level uh, thought processes uh, uh, in uh, group situations, in social situations. Sometimes what everyone knows is pretty accurate. Sometimes uh, it's not so accurate at all. You, we really can't tell the difference relying only on common sense. Social psychology uses science to find the most reliable rules about human thought, emotion, and behavior. Wilhelm Wundt, a good German, uh, argued for the development of social psychology back in 1862. Wundt had the first psychological laboratory in Leipzig, Germany. In 1896, Norman Triplett of Indiana University conducted the first social psychology experiment when he set out to prove that competition increased performance. And this is known as social facilitation. So this is what Triplett was looking for. In 1898, uh, he did an experiment where he set children winding a thread on a reel, sometimes on their own and sometimes against others. What he found confirmed his theory. When children went the children went faster when they were, when they were in competition. Uh, so it's probably the same way. If you if you're a runner, uh, if you're running against somebody else, you can run faster. You will run faster. If you're running by yourself, you probably won't run nearly as fast. In 1924, uh, Floyd Altport uh, published an influential text on social psychology. Now remember, we talked about Gordon Altport before. This is Gordon, and there, this is his brother, Floyd. Society for the Psychological Study of uh, Social Issues was founded in 1936 by the Allport brothers, it was first in. Uh, it was just in time because the years following publication were fought with world upheaval. Uh, the uh, uh, Mussolini was the first fascist leader in uh, Italy in 1927. 1932, uh, Hitler became the leader uh, in Germany, and he started changing things in Germany. And fascism became a, a political movement in the world. Uh, we were we were right in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, it started in 1929. It went all the way through the 30s into the uh, into 1940. <clears throat> so there was a lot of stuff going on. Um, uh, fascism, of course, uh, became uh, very popular around the world. Uh, it was, uh, as I said, Mussolini uh, was uh, a fascist leader uh, in uh, in Italy. Hitler was a fascist leader in Germany, and in Spain, Franco was a fascist leader. And, of course, they fought the Spanish Civil War in the, in the uh, 1930s, late 1930s, and Franco won. And, of course, in 1939, the uh, World, War, World War II started, and Hitler and Mussolini uh, attacked uh, uh, people around the world uh, trying to uh, force them to accept their fascist ideas. Just after World War I, German psychologists Kurt Kafka, uh, Max Wertheimer, and Wolfgang Kohler, uh, students of Karl Stumpf, uh, shaped the concept of Gestalt psychology. There's a reason why I put Karl Stumpf in here. Uh, I actually taught his granddaughter, or was, she, was he his great-granddaughter? Uh, when I was at Ashford University, she uh, uh, she was an exchange, not an exchange student, but she came over from Germany uh, to, uh, to to go to school at Ashford University. 
in Clinton, Iowa. So I, I thought I'd put that in there. <laughs> they were students of Karl Stumpf. Um, Gestalt emphasizes that the mind actively organizes stimuli into meaningful holes. If we have just little pieces of ideas, uh, Gestalt tries to pull everything together and make it organized. If you don't understand how a, an engine works, uh, what, the, what a carburetor is, uh, if you only understand little pieces of it, you, uh, you know, that's Gestalt is the idea that it works because everything comes together. Gestalt sees a social environment not only made up of individuals, but also relations between individuals, relationships that have important psychological implications. Gestalt saw groups as social entities that led to the tradition of group processes and group dynamics. Uh, changing group dynamics. Uh, Carl was a Navy SEAL. After he got out of the Navy, he confronted his sexuality and joined a local gay group in San Diego. Before Carl, uh, before Carl joined the group, they would just sit around in a bar and complain about how they were treated in the community. After Carl joined the group, members were more willing to admit their sexuality and they became more socially active. Why? Because Carl was there. Carl had changed the group dynamic. He had made them bolder. After World War II, social psychology blossomed as research sought answers to problems of the day. Theodore Adorno and Stanley Milgram had influential research programs searching to explain Nazi atrocities. How in the world could the Nazis exterminate so many people in a uh, mechanical way? Uh, they, the, uh, the death camps uh, that they maintained, uh, they not only uh, uh, eliminated their, their rivals, uh, the, uh, the fascists were, were anti-communists, uh, so they were, they were killing off all of the Bolsheviks and all the socialists. They, were also, they also decided that the Jewish population was the enemy population, and so they tried to exterminate as many Jews as possible. They also didn't like uh, gypsies. They also didn't like uh, evangelical Christians. And all of these people, uh, they, they uh, tried to exterminate. So how in the world could they do this? How, uh, who has this concept of genocide? That was, uh, that was what Theodore Adorno and Stanley Milgram tried to uh, uh, determine in their uh, research programs. Leon Festinger developed a theory of cognitive dissonance trying to explain how Germans could ignore the obvious. And uh, I, I was in Germany um, in, in the 1970s, and so a lot of the people that I talked to were alive during World War II. And it was really kind of interesting because it was like they just ignored everything that was going on. Anything that, bad, that uh, was bad going on, they just tried to ignore it. Uh, kind of like uh, what uh, uh, Southerners uh, did before the Civil War, as far as slavery was concerned. They kind of just didn't acknowledge that something was going on. Kenneth Clark and Mamie Phipps Clark uh, studied effects of segregation on the self-concept of black children, and of course uh, some of their work uh, led to the integration of, uh, of education in the United States. Ethical concerns spurred discussion and reform in the 1960s and 1970s. Protection of experimental participants from psychological distress became a concern following Milgram's obedience study and Zimbardo's Stanford prison study. And we're going to talk about both of these studies later. Uh, really kind of fascinating studies. Um, Stanley Milgram, well, we won't go into this. Zimbardo's still alive, and he's still writing textbooks, which is, it, but in the 1970s, he did, he did his famous Stanford prison study uh, that uh, led to uh, a lot of changes in the way things work. Institutional review boards were developed to meet this need uh, because psychologists were, were doing some really strange things. The world very much dictates to the social psychologist what it is that they will study. In the 1940s, prejudice seemed to grip the world, and it was the main topic of, int of interest to social psychologists. So prejudice was the theme of the 1940s. What are we talking about? We're talking about uh, Germans hating Jews. 
Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, African -Amer Americans in the United States uh, being treated very poorly. Uh, we're also talking about uh, immigrants in the United States from uh, Southern Europe, Southern and Eastern Europe. There were negative terms that people used for Italians and Greeks and uh, Bohemians uh, from that portion of, uh, un and Hungarians. Uh, there were, and, and people from Poland, uh, they, there were some really negative uh, um, epithets that were used for these individuals. Uh, until World War II. And then in World War II, of course, every, they had to get everybody together to, to fight the war. Uh, so a lot of those prejudices, a lot of those terms um, uh, became passe. Uh, they didn't all die away, uh, but prejudice was huge in the 1940s. So that's what social psychologists were looking at. In the 1950s, it was intolerance. The idea that, uh, of course, Jim Crow was still... Uh, active in uh, in the South, uh, so intolerance to the fact that uh, that the white population in the South could would not uh, tolerate uh, African Americans. The same thing was happening with American Indians uh, in Indian country. Uh, they were being treated as second class citizens. So there was a lot of intolerance going on. Uh, there was a lot of religious intolerance. Uh, to Catholics uh, in the 1940s and 1950s. In the 1960s, uh, the topic was aggression uh, because there were uh, the war in Vietnam was going on and there were a lot of people that were quite upset uh, about the war in Vietnam. It didn't make a lot of sense to them. And so aggression became a, uh, the topic uh, of the 1960s. 1970s, uh, women in the United States decided, uh, and around the world, women decided that they were being treated as, as second-class citizens, and they didn't want to put up with it anymore. So feminism was the, uh, was the topic of concern in the 1970s. In the 1980s, we realized that, uh, that the, the Soviet Union at the time um, and the United States and all of the uh, allied countries to both of those uh, entities um, uh, maintained this huge arsenal of, uh, of nuclear weapons that could potentially destroy the world many times over. And because of that, uh, in the 1980s, the topic of concern was the arms race. Uh, of course, you don't remember any of this because you, most of you weren't born uh, before the uh, 1990s. So the, uh, the, the whole idea that, uh, that uh, uh, we, we were one push of a button away from uh, total annihilation in, of everyone in the world uh, was just massive in the 1980s. In the 1990s, it uh, was diversity was the topic of concern. 1950s, as we said before, it was intolerance, especially of African Americans. Um, the Supreme Court passed uh, the uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. Is that right? No. Um, what is it? Oh, I can't think of a case. Anyway, they, they said that uh, separate but equal was no, no longer acceptable. So uh, African Americans had to have the, the same education that, uh, that whites did. And so there was... No, anyway, I can't think of it. It was a, a case that was brought up in Topeka, Kansas. Anyway, intolerance in the 1950s, 1960s aggression. Uh, of course, I was going to college at this in, in the end of the 1960s, uh, so this was all going on while I was uh, while I was in college. 1970s uh, feminism. My sister was a big feminist. She started now the National Organization for Women. National Organization for Women. Uh, she started that organization in Indiana. I'm from Indiana, and of course she did. She was a feminist. 1980s, the arms race, of course, nuclear bombs mean certain death to everyone. Uh, and there was, uh, uh, this was, this was big around the world. 1990s, diversity, and I've got the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, of course, not just the color of their suits, but as you can see, the uh, different races, a lot of diversity 
be became very important uh, to people in the 1990s. 2000, uh, 2000s terrorism uh, because of 9-11. September 11th, uh, when uh, the, the uh, Al-Qaeda attacked uh, the World Trade Center and the uh, Pentagon. Preconception, uh, so we have ideas about what things are supposed to look like. This is whatever this is. This is a optical illusion. Looks like water coming down, then all of a sudden it turns into monks wearing white outfits. Uh, man's playing his guitar uh, on top of his house. And of course, the houses turn into people in the background. A little strange. The question is, how many horses are there? And the answer is, you have to count heads, not legs. There's one, two, three, four, five. There we go. All five horses. I think that's all there are. Yeah, five, five heads. And of course, uh, this is a puzzle. Is she in the puzzle or is she standing there? That's the question. Uh, though most scientists uh, would like to deny it, it is nearly impossible for them to put their cultural values aside and to view another culture or their own with an open mind. These commonly held values are known as social representations. Uh, you, you are Diné. Uh, I am, we are both Americans. Uh, we have a difficult time looking at another culture, say a culture from Africa or a culture from New Guinea, a culture from Australia, uh, with an open mind. It's very difficult, almost impossible. Two movements that have forced social scientists to acknowledge their social representations have been feminism and Marxism. Fe feminism has forced social scientists to question their Eurocentric idea of male domination and Marxism has forced them to question the idea of deference to the rich and powerful. And of course, uh, if we think about history, if we think about uh, European history, we think about American history, one of the problems that, uh, that uh, people coming uh, over here from Europe had was the fact that it was a, not just Eurocent the fact that they were Eurocentric, but it was very male-dominated. So the idea was, whenever they confronted a, a, a new group of indigenous people, they tried to find the male that was in charge, because as far as they were concerned, concerned males were always in charge. The other thing about Europe at this time was the fact that they uh, were controlled by monarchies. All the countries of Europe were controlled by monarchies, which meant that the rich and the powerful were the people that you um, that you that you uh, placated. The people that were the most important to you were the rich and powerful. So it became very difficult for people coming over from Europe to understand that possibly females could be in charge, that possibly not the richest person was important. Uh, if you read the history, if you uh, read the history of the Diné people, it's really kind of interesting because they kept trying to make people, they, uh, individuals in charge of things. And these were the individuals they tried to uh, get to sign treaties. Uh, they tried to control them. Uh, and these were the people with the most money and the and the males. They were they were always looking for a male leader uh, when dealing with the uh, uh, Diné people. Really kind of fascinating if you read. Uh, what am I reading? Oh, Navajo Wars. It's a really fascinating book. Um, it, the uh, uh, who told me about? Oh, uh, Brian King. If you've ever taken a class from Brian King, uh, he's the one that told me about the book. He said that was uh, a really good book. Uh, dealing with uh, uh, Diné history. Social scientists in general and psychologists in particular are required to constantly decide what is right or what is normal. These are all value judgments. Is, is, is per, a person acting mature or are they acting immature? Are they well adjusted or are they poorly adjusted? Are they mentally healthy or are they mentally ill? As a psychologist, this is my job. My job is to tell 
people if somebody is acting uh, appropriately, uh, if they are adjusted, and if they are mentally ill. This is what we're looking for. And these are all value judgments. Uh, it's really kind of interesting. Psychology accepts the fact the fact that different individuals will see things differently. If you took this class from my colleague, uh, who is female, and is about 20 years younger than I am, then potentially she would teach this class differently than I, than I do. She's from Wisconsin. I'm from Indiana. Uh, I grew up in the 1960s and 1970s. She grew up in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, you know, there, there are so many differences. Uh, she got her education uh, in, the, uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, I think she got her PhD from uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, if I'm not mistaken. And I got my PhD online from Walden University. I spent, uh, as soon as I graduated from college with my bachelor's degree, I went into the military and I, I stayed with the military for the next 30 years. So I got to move around a lot. Uh, I got to see a lot of things. So you know, all of these, all of these things add up to the way that I see the world and the way that she sees the world. And these are all value judgments. So if we were to look at the same individual, she may say that the person's acting mature, and I may see the person's acting immature. She may see somebody and she says, they look healthy to me. I might look at the same individual and say, I think that that person is mentally ill. And of course, you know, that's just the way psychologists are. Uh, we all have our own opinions. And of course, all of these are value judgments. Uh, is this nudity? Uh, is this up okay? This is the famous uh, Michelangelo's uh, David uh, in, uh, in uh, I think it's in Florence. And of course, this is Justice. Justice is showing off her chest, her naked chest. And this is a, uh, this is a sculpture from Washington in Washington DC and this is a sculpture in Washington DC. So the question is is this obscene? These are the Karubo of the Amazon rainforest. They don't wear any clothes ever. They don't know what clothes are. They walk around completely naked. Is this okay? Is that okay? Is that okay? That's Miley Cyrus and her famous Wrecking Ball from her Wrecking Ball album. So if we look at these individuals and we look at these individuals, these are sculptures, of course. Is this obscene? Is that obscene? Is that obscene? These are all value judgments. You can say, you know, they're all obscene because they are showing naked uh, human beings humans, but you know, this, these are all value judgments. Isn't this it's kind of fascinating? Uh, nudity is, 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 the reason I use nudity is because nudity is one of those questions that people have really emotional uh, thoughts about. Um, you know, is, is, it's a naked sculpture uh, obscene. Um, should we put clothes on the people of the uh, of the Amazon uh, should Miley Cyrus have uh, rocked back and forth on that on that wrecking ball, which actually I've never seen her video. One reason why any psychological theory should be approached with a degree of skepticism is because the theory was developed utilizing a select scientist's value judgments. This is Abraham Maslow. He, he's the one that came up with the hierarchy of needs. Maslow's heroes that he used to define his self-actualized individuals were all Jewish intellectuals who had escaped from Nazi Germany. And these were the ones that he, that this is where he came up with his theory. Uh, Abraham Maslow was a Zionist, and he believed that, uh, that, the, that Jewish people should have their own country. Uh, and this was before Israel was Israel. Uh, so, so he helped, he went into a Europe. Uh, the, uh, the Nazis were starting to capture 
and imprison the Jewish population in Germany, and a lot of the intellectuals in Germany were, uh, were Jewish. And so he helped them escape to the United States. Now, if, if you understand how, what was going on during World War II, there were a lot of individuals that didn't want to allow Jewish people to immigrate to another country. And the United States was one of those countries that only allowed in select individuals. They wouldn't allow in masses of, Jew of, of Jewish people into the United States. There was an anti-immigrant uh, movement that happened in the 1920s, and there were immigration laws in the United States that blocked these individuals from coming in. But uh, Maslow was able to either sneak them into the country or because they were intellectuals, because they had things that, uh, that we needed in the United States, uh, then uh, you know, science and, and art and whatnot, uh, we were able to get them to come into the United States. One of them, of course, was uh, Albert Einstein, was allowed to come into the United States. Thank goodness that he did because Albert Einstein's theory of relativity uh, had to do, to, to do with the uh, making of the, uh, of the atomic bomb, which stopped, ended the war in uh, World War II. Nationalism versus patriotism. Moafiq is from Afghanistan and wants to prevent the United States from destroying his country. He considers himself patriotic. Kyle is from Pittsburgh and not only backs the United States invasion as patriotic, but he sees Moafiq's position as blindly nationalistic. Kyle sees the invasion of Afghanistan, Afghanistan as a patriotic endeavor to keep terrorists out of the United States. Moafiq doesn't like it. Kyle does. Both of them consider the, uh, themselves uh, uh, patriot, patriotic, and both of them consider the other individual nationalistic. Now, of course, you know, we're, we're out of Afghanistan now, but this is just an example. Open-ended marriage versus adultery. When Jocko married Simone, he told her from the start that he was not sure he, would stick, he could stick with the monogamy thing. Three years into the marriage, he came home early to find his wife having an affair with his bald next-door uh, neighbor. He accused her of adultery and defended his own indiscretions as an agreed-upon open-ended marriage. So it's okay for him to do it, but it's not okay for her to do it. There's the bald-headed neighbor right there. Amb ambitious versus aggressive, Marlene and Marlon were after the same promotion at work. Both put in extra hours and, and put in a great deal of uh, overtime. While both demanded a great deal from their workers, Marlene was branded as aggressive, while Marlon was seen as ambitious. No one wanted to work for an aggressive female, but they didn't mind working for an ambitious male, even though the results were exactly the same. Value judgments. Timid versus cautious, Daryl and Daryl went to the same school and were in the same grade. Both were seen as shy when they were young. When they entered high school, Daryl was teased mercilessly as being cautious, while Daryl was seen as demure and ladylike for her timidity. So Daryl, this was a negative as far as Daryl was concerned. But as far as Daryl was concerned, the young female, she was seen as demure and ladylike, even though they acted exactly the same. Value judgments. Perversions are sex acts that we do not practice. So if you don't do it, then it's, a, it's perverted. For a period of time, the Clinton-Lewinsky affair rocked the foundations of the United States government. Portions of the populace were appalled by perversions. The two pr participated in the myriad of jokes showed their idea of, uh, of normal. So as far as the Republicans were concerned, this Democratic monster, uh, Bill Clinton, was a perverted monster. He was, uh, he was, well, and we're going to get into to something uh, that, that deals with this in just a second. So as far as the Republicans were, were concerned, he was perverted because he did all these nasty things. And, of course, the Democrats tried to, to, uh, to uh, support him because he was their president. Social science uh, uh, 
many times will get caught between what is and what the scientists believe ought to be. This is known as the naturalistic fallacy. When the missionaries first arrived in Hawaii, they found that the rampant lack of clothes, bad, and the hula lascivious. Uh, they clothed the islanders and remade the hula in their own frumpish ways. The hula used to be a, uh, you know, a marital right, uh, so it was supposed to be sexual. Uh, you, didn't, you wore just the grass skirt, you didn't wear anything underneath. As a matter of fact, when they first arrived there, they, uh, the Hawaiians rarely wore any clothes. I don't know if you've ever been to Hawaii, but it's 80 degrees every day. <laughs> <laughs> really nice. <laughs> but, of course, because the uh, missionaries uh, were from the United States and England, they decided that they needed to put clothes on those, those nasty little Hawaiians. Naturalistic fallacy. What, what is and what ought to be. And, of course, uh, there you go. Is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? Well, in in the Muslim world, uh, this is okay, but this is certainly not okay. In the United States, this is okay, but this probably would be looked negatively at. The self is shaped by and shapes the social environment. The self is our social being that has the ability to use symbols to communicate with itself through self-awareness. Self-awareness and symbol usage may have evolved as a means to deal with an increasingly complex social environment. Self-awareness allows people to reflect on their own actions as a means of, uh, to understand what others might do. Communication allows people to coordinate activities. The self-serving bias, the tendency to take credit for success, uh, but deny responsibility for failure affects our self-concepts and therefore affects the way that we respond to social events. We use it to protect our sense of self-worth. So if you uh, don't pass a class um, and, uh, and you, you may be saying, well, it's all the professor's fault. He just had too much material and, and, he, and he was just too strict. That is... Uh, not, not taking responsibility for your failures. But if you pass a class, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the professor. He was so good. I, it was easy for me to get that material. Nah, that's not the way it works. Usually people take cr full credit for uh, their successes and no credit at all for their failures. And this is to protect our sense of self-worth. And this is okay because psychologically, we need to maintain a positive attitude about ourselves. So if this is what you have to do to maintain your self-worth, that's okay. I don't mind being blamed for, for your failure if you do happen to fail. Quarles uh, probably drinks a little more than he should, and when he does, he becomes obnoxious and verbally abusive. Quarles has been married and divorced twice from women who everyone else saw as lovely and caring, but whom he refers to as harridans. A harridan is a strict, bossy, or belligerent old woman. So he saw these two ladies as harridans. Quarles' description of his exes is a case of self-serving bias. And so I invite you to, to listen to Margaritaville. If I play Margaritaville, then uh, it's, it, it's a uh, copyright infringement. So, and, and if I try to, to, uh, to publish it, of course, then I, will, I won't really get in trouble. Uh, they'll go ahead and publish it, but they'll say that there's possible copyright infringement. So go ahead and listen to Mar uh, Margaritaville. It's a really good, interesting song from the 1970s, I think. Maybe in the 1960s. The great Danish philosopher and theologian Soren Kierkegaard uh, once said, Life is lived forwards, but it's understood backwards. This is one reason why when people are given information, they tend to think that it was not knowable all along. And this is known as what we refer to as common sense. This is also known as I knew it all along phenomenon or hindsight bias. Eh, I knew it all along. The United States dominant culture emphasizes uniqueness and individuality. More of the millennial generation says that they are unique than previous generations. They are also more tolerant of others 
differences uh, than previous generations. And this is really good. And this needs to continue. We need to be uh, to increase our tolerance of each other. One of the problems we're having right now in the United States is partisanship. Uh, Republicans versus Democrats. Uh, Republicans are saying that all Democrats are, what are they saying that, that Democrats are? Uh, that Democrats are uh, um, uh, communists, that they're all socialists, that they're all uh, extremely liberal, uh, and of course uh, the uh, Democrats on the other, other on the other hand uh, see Republicans as fascist and intolerant. Individualism, uh, take care of yourself and immediate family only. You pursue your own goals. You don't like being influenced by the group. That's what individualism is. In the United States, we're more individualistic than we are collectivistic. Collectivism, this is something that we see in Asia, uh, Japan, Korea, uh, especially China. Uh, in, in, these, in, in the collectivist idea, you take care of others within your group. The group goals are more important than the individual goals and you accept group influence. About 70% of the world's population lives in societies with strong collectivist philosophies. So where are the other 30%? The other 30% are primarily in Europe, the United States and Canada, uh, to some degree in South America. Australia is, uh, is uh, more individualistic, uh, but collectivism, uh, Africa, uh, parts of uh, South America, uh, Asia, especially in Asia. Now, you have to remember that uh, China has, what, 1.8 billion people? Uh, and uh, India has 1.2 billion or 1.3 billion people. So if we, and the third largest country in the world, the third most populous country in the world is the United States. And we only have 300 million people. So there are more than 1 billion people uh, in India than in the United States. There are more than 1.5 billion people in China than in the United States. So as you can see, uh, when we add all of this up, India and, and uh, uh, China, uh, we're, we're talking about 3 billion people. Is that right? Yeah, 3 billion people, over 3 billion people. And in the United States, we only have 300 million, about 350 million, something like that. The goal of evolutionary psychology is to look for explanations for behavioral universals. This discipline seeks uh, how these uh, behaviors might have enhanced odds of reproductive success. Remember that individuals don't evolve. Populations evolve over many generations. You are all you're going to be. You're never going to evolve into something else. That does, that's not the way it works. It's your children and your children's children and your children's children's children that evolve. They change over to, they, uh, you change, potentially things will evolve, but you have to uh, reproduce in order for that to take place. A trait that may have been adaptive at one point may persist and become maladaptive as the environment changes. And this is one of the things that we have to think about. As psychologists, as evolutionary psychologists, we have to think about these things. How, has, how have things changed? Does this concept of, uh, of, of does monogamy, uh, we have monogamy in the United States. We made polygamy illegal uh, in the United States. Well, this kind of hurt the, the Mormon religion because Mormons were polygamists. This also hurt a lot of American Indian um, uh, groups uh, because they were polygamous. Uh, and that's one of the things I just learned about the Navajo in uh, left-handed son of old man hat uh, was that his father had more, had two wives, uh, his mother, and then there was another lady. And if his mother made him mad, then he would go live with the other lady, <laughs> which was kind of Kind of fascinating. But then again, I'm only on page 26. So we'll see what happens in the rest of the book. Uh, sex and gender. Sex is the biological state of being male or female. This is your plumbing. So you're either born as a male or a female. Uh, the probability of being born with both uh, is really, really remote. That's not, uh, that's uh, referred to as being a hermaphrodite. Uh, that is very, very rare. 
That's re that's reality, okay? Uh, your gender, so your sex is your biological state of being male or female. Gender is your psychological state of being masculine or feminine, your way of relating to the world. And so uh, I just took a survey where they asked me if I was heterosexual, homos, no, did I identify myself as a male or a female? And then they said binary or queer or I, I can't remember all. I, I should have written it down. I just took that survey. It's really kind of fascinating. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, gender has to do with how you see yourself, your psychological state of being either masculine or feminine or whatever, uh, what, uh, whatever else. Uh, I understand that Facebook has over 56 different uh, 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 configurations, uh, male, female, uh, non-binary. Yeah, it gets really interesting. That's fine. However you see yourself, that's your gender. Social neuroscience examines relationships between social and neural processes. Social neuroscience helps us understand which cognitive processes are involved in specific behavior. This discipline has developed to study relationships between neural processes and social processes. The development of functional MRIs and PET scans have uh, helped spur collaboration between neuroscience and social psychology. These new imaging techniques measure the level of metabolism in regions and individual cells in the brain so that we can see what's happening specifically in specific areas of your brain. Uh, we can see how much metabolism is taking place. Are you, wh which part of your brain are you thinking in? Well, it's the part that you're metabolizing, where the metabol um, um, <laughs> metabolism is taking place. That's, that's the area that is, is uh, uh, being activated in your brain. Evolutionary psychology looks to explain social behaviors that appear to be cultural universals. Topics studied by evolutionary psychologists include aggression, helping, interpersonal attraction, love, and stereotyping. Why do we stereotype? How in the world do we fall in love? Who do we find attractive? Why do we help people or not help people? And why are we aggressive? Caution has been raised about how to apply evolutionary principles to contemporary behaviors. The problem is what we thought in the past has changed over time. Remember, the 1960s were the time of aggression. This was when people were being overly aggressive. Now people are being overly aggressive again. Uh, what happened uh, last weekend? Oh, the, uh, that kid went into a uh, black grocery store in Buffalo, New York, and started killing black people. Why? Because he was afraid that they were going to replace white people, as interesting as that is. Where does he get these ideas? Where do, do these aggressive ideas come from? Why did he think that this was an acceptable uh, thing to do? And, of course, a lot of it has to do with, so, do with social media. And we're going to, of course, uh, investigate these things. Positive psychology is an emerging perspective in social psychology. Positive psychologists attempt to focus on positive aspects of human functioning to increase well-being. Positive psychology's main emphasis is to teach people to avoid harmful self-deceptions while still maintaining a sense of realistic optimism about life. Morality is one of the areas focused on by positive psychologists. These psychologists focus on standards of right and wrong to understand how moral judgments help or hinder social relations. And I am a positive psychologist. I will try to maintain that attitude throughout most of my teaching. And that is the end of the first chapter. We're going to actually tackle two chapters today. No, we're not. It's next week. Nope, we're going to do it this week. Okay, okay, let's tackle chapter two. <laughs> chapter two has to do with research in social psychology. <clears throat> okay, fun. And it's green. Research done in social psychology follows a scientific method. You gather information, you analyze that information, and then you interpret that information. The social psychologist first observes a phenomenon, reads existing literature on the topic, and then they develop a theory about that phenomenon. 
So this is what this is how we do things. This is the way the scientific method works. First thing you do is you observe a phenomenon. Whoa, um, uh, my cat keeps climbing the tree. And then we le read the existing literature on the topic. I need to read everything I can, can on, on cats climbing trees. And then we come up with a theory. I think cats climb trees to get away from the damn dog. Okay, there you go. So that I saw the phenomenon, I read all the literature on the phenomenon, and then I came up with a theory on the phenomenon. A theory is an integrated set of principles that explains and predicts observed events. I think if the dog chases the cat, she'll go up a tree again. While basic research can be characterized as research that is not applicable but advances scientific knowledge, applied research increases the understanding of and solutions to real-world problems by using current knowledge. Basic and applied research can inform each other, leading to greater scientific progress. And this is the reason we do both basic and applied research. Uh, applied research... Uh, it increases our understanding of what's going on. Uh, basic research uh, gives us uh, principles to, uh, to fall back on, to look at, uh, to consider uh, as we are applying our research to realistic, uh, real-world uh, problems. From the theory, the scientists develops their hypotheses. Hypotheses are testable propositions that describe a relationship that may exist between events. Hypotheses allow us to test a theory by suggesting how we might try to falsify it. Hypotheses give direction to research. Because hypotheses are predictive, they tend to also be more practical. Okay, let me, let me tell you about my own research. I was teaching up in, uh, on the uh, uh, Fort Belknap Reservation in uh, Montana. And one of the things I noticed was that a lot of my friends and a lot of my friends and colleagues uh, were recovered drug or alcohol, uh, alcoholics. Uh, not all of them, of course, but some of them were. And I thought to myself, well, this is kind of amazing. These individuals have been able to get, get away from their, from their addiction, whatever that is, and they've shown all of this amazing resilience. Uh, that's what I observed. And so what I decided, so what my theory was, was that American Indians are resilient. A well, I was dealing with a specific population, of course. Uh, but that was my theory. Uh, so then I developed a hypothesis. And my, my hypothesis was that if I give these individuals a test uh, that measures resilience, that they will score high on the resilience scale. That was my theory. And of course, you can't just say, well, people are resilient. You have to find out what are some of the factors that lead to their resilience. Was it the fact that uh, the older people are more resilient than younger people? Was it the fact that the highly educated were more, were more resilient uh, than, the, uh, than the, the people with little education? Uh, was it the fact that uh, they had never experienced any trauma and that's why they were so resilient? Was it the fact that their culture was, was helping them uh, be resilient? What's the other one? Wait a minute, I got one more. Trauma. Uh, <laughs> age, education, <laughs> trauma, and, uh, and culture. There's one more. I'll think of it in a minute. Okay, anyway, I, there were, I had five variables. Okay, so my hypothesis was that, uh, that American Indians, uh, at least the population I was going to judge, judge, I was going to uh, do research on, were, um, were, were resilient. Ethical concerns about the study must be addressed, including whether use of deception is justified. And, of course, I didn't. Inst I didn't. I didn't uh, try to deceive them. Institutional review boards protect the safety and well-being of study participants because IRBs require adherence to specific guidelines, including the idea of informed consent. So I told everybody what I was doing, and I told everybody what my, hypo blah, 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 what my hypothesis was. Education, age, I can't think of the fourth one. 
our fifth one. The independent variable is manipulated by the researcher. It is the variable presumed uh, to cause the change in other variables. The de dependent variable, on the other hand, is the one measured by the researcher to see if changes depend on the level of independent variables. And what I've been ta ta talking about were independent variables. My dependent variable was resilient. My independent variable uh, was education, <laughs> age, oh, gender. Gender was the fifth one. Okay. Uh, age, education, level of trauma, uh, cultural uh, awareness, and gender. Are females more resilient than males? That's what I wanted to find out. Those are my five independent variables. Uh, age, gender, trauma, <laughs> resilience, and education. Okay. Experiment is not just another word for study. It has partic uh, particular meaning. The experimenter manipulates the independent variable, age. I could, I, and actually, I didn't uh, manipulate the independent variable. I just used them uh, to find out if uh, older people were more resilient, if more educated people were more resilient, if females were more resilient than males, if trauma was a factor in, uh, in resilience, and if uh, culture was a, a factor in resilience. Um, it uses random assignment to put people in groups or, or conditions. Of course, I didn't have to do that. They measure the de dependent variable, and that's what I was that, that's what I was looking at. Controls all uh, other variables as much as possible, and of course, I was just looking at a cross section of uh, of a population. The groups are equivalent at the start of the experiment. They experience uh, different levels of the uh, independent variable. They don't experience any other differences because everything else is controlled. So if the groups are different at the end of the study, it can only be because of the difference in levels of, uh, of the independent variable. Internal validity refers to making sure that nothing else besides the independent variable can affect the dependent, the, the dependent variable. This is accomplished by controlling all extraneous variables and by randomly assigning people to different experimental conditions. Internal validity is established by controlling all extraneous variables and by using random assignment to conditions. And of course, that, my, my study didn't have anything to do with uh, in any of these things. Even with uh, random assignment, there is a small uh, probability that different characteristics of people are distributed differently across conditions. To guard against misinterpreting results, scientists calculate the probability level, or the p-level, p-value, I'm sorry, that their results would occur by chance. And of course, this is what I did. I, I had to, to develop my p-level um, <clears throat> for all of my uh, independent variables. External validity is the extent to which the results of a study can be generalized to other situations and other people. Mundane realism is the extent to which an experiment is similar to real-life situations. Psychological realism is the extent to which the psychological processes triggered in an experiment are similar to psychological processes that occur in everyday life. Field experiments are more natural settings, uh, lead to easier generalization. Less control leads to less assurance about cause and effect. Lab experiments are unnatural settings that may limit uh, generalizability. Uh, it's easier to control uh, leads uh, to the stronger causal claim. And of course, mine was a was a, a survey, and so it was. You, I guess you could call it a field experiment. It certainly wasn't a lab experiment. Virtual environment technology, early studies suggest a promising combination of realism and control where you have virt virtual environment technology. What they're talking about is putting a people, in, people in a scenario in a virtual environment and uh, seeing how they react to that virtual environment. Web-based web studies recruit many people uh, use and uh, in social psychology, we, we see a lot of this. Uh, that run, run studies remotely, cheap and easy, non-representative samples, but so are psych uh, students or any college students, non-representative samples. The problem is finding a representative sample. Implicit measures, reporting what people don't know that they think, 
uh, and brain imaging techniques, of course. Those are, we've talked about PET scans and functional MRIs. Dr. V Belvedere observed that his female students complained about their boyfriends more than they did their husbands, while men complained about their wives, but rarely about their girlfriends. This is what Dr. Belvedere saw. Dr. Belvedere theorized that women treat men differently when they are dating than when they are married. This made women complain more before the wedding and men to complain more after the wedding. Belvedere hypothesized that women believe that if they marry a man, they will be able to change all of his faults. He also hypothesized that men believe that if they marry their girlfriend, things will remain the same as they were when they were dating. Okay, that was his hypothesis. This is, he, he saw men as thinking differently than women do. Women think, men think that they're, their wives will always act like their girl, they did when they were their girlfriend, girlfriends. Women think that they can change men after they get married. Social psychology uses four approaches to research. Field research is done in natural, real-life settings outside the laboratory. Laboratory research is done in a laboratory, of course. Correlational research compares two or more variables, usually from a field study. And experimental research manipulates one or more variables in a controlled setting. Belvedere decided to do a preliminary meta-analysis study on his hypothesis and found that studies from 50, the 50s and 60s showed that women during their, that era rarely complained about men. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the studies showed increasing complaints about men. Belvedere decided to bring a group of subjects into the lab and give them a fictional scenario that the individuals would have to respond to. He discovered that men expected women to try to change them after marriage, and women felt compelled to try to change men. The observational method involves systematic observation and measurement of behavior. So if I had gone to, to uh, Walmart and watched people at Walmart, that would be an, obser that would be an uh, observational method. Ethno ethnography is a type of observational method used by cultural anthropologists and social psychologists to study and understand a group or culture. And uh, Dr. Ami will talk about uh, ethnography. Uh, if you haven't taken that class from her, uh, fabulous class. She's a wonderful instructor. Listen to everything she says. She knows what she's talking about. Participant ob observation is a form of systematic observation whereby the observer interacts with the people being observed, but tries not to change the situation in any way. Participant ob observation. Belvedere's next step was to put together a field study approach. He hired 25 males and 25 females, to keep a diary of all their conversations over a two-week period. They were not allowed to steer any conversation toward the topic. There were not enough episodes of people complaining about the opposite sex to make any determination, so Belvedere decided to allow the people to bring the topic up in conversation. He decided he would manipulate this variable. Interjudge reliability, the level of agreement between two or more people who independently observe and code a set of data. So if we had two people looking at children, uh, looking uh, at the way that they interact on the playground, um, they may not see the same things. Uh, so interjudge reliability is the how much they agree with one another. Archival analysis is a form of observational method whereby the researcher examines the accumulated documents of a culture. They look at documented information from the past. When researchers decide, when researchers decide to do uh, research, they determine a population that they're going to perform the research on. The population could be as large as the world population or the people taking social psychology at Ashford, and that should say Diné College. I'm sorry. I, I didn't read over this before I... <laughs> before I, st I gave you the lecture. Oh, I have to change that. A random sample is a survey procedure where every person in the population being studied has an equal chance of inclusion. By only allowing a college or prison population to be surveyed, 
a researcher is creating an unrepresentative sample because college kids tend to be 18, 19, 20 years old. Prison populations tend to be criminals. So you're dealing with a very special population in both cases. Meta-analysis examines the outcomes of many studies. Meta-analysis is, is a statistical technique used to combine information from many empirical studies on a single topic to objectively estimate the reliability and overall size of the effect. Meta-analytic researchers strive to include non-published studies to avoid the file drawer effect. In other words, a lot of people, when uh, their studies didn't turn out the way they wanted to, they don't, they don't publish. So they just stick it in a file drawer, and that's known as the file drawer effect. You only get positive studies and no negative studies. Since findings from a single study are less convincing than findings from a series of studies, a meta-analysis can provide a clear statement of the state of research on a topic. And this can also uh, tell you uh, how people think regionally. Uh, if you have uh, research that's done in New York City and research that's done in, in Los Angeles, is it going to be the same as, are you going to get the, exactly the same results as you would in rural Mississippi, in rural North Dakota, in rural Arizona? And that's the question. This is one of the reasons why we look at, we, why we look at meta-analysis. A lot of times we're getting information uh, from urban areas that uh, do not reflect what's going on in rural areas. A researcher can prejudice his sample by using an unrepresentative sample. Other ways of prejudicing the results of the survey include order of questions, limited response options, uh, question wording, demand characteristics, subtle cueing of the participant to answer in a desired way. And of course, all of this has to do with how you write your survey. Participant observation is a subset of naturalistic observation. The researcher joins the group being studied as a participant. A classic example of this type of research is the study of a doomsday cult by Leon Festinger and his colleagues in 1956. After infiltrating the cult, Festinger and his colleagues chronicled the co cognitive dissonance of the cult leader and followers when the world didn't end on 20, uh, 21 December 1956 the cognitive dissonance. Kind of fascinating. And we're going to talk about cults, actually, in Chapter 7, I believe. I just went through that. <laughs> and added uh, modern-day cults, which is kind of fascinating. One reason the laboratory research is so widely used in science is because variables can be controlled. The variable that is manipulated or controlled by the researcher is known as the independent variable, the variable that is tested or measured is known as the dependent variable, and we've been through this before. Doing research on people who are not aware that the experiment is about, uh, about is not ethical. For individuals to uh, participate, the researcher, researcher should first inform the subject about what and why the experiment is being done, and this is known as informed consent. Deception is misleading participants about the true purpose of a study. Debriefing is explaining to participants at the end of an experiment the true purpose of the study. The correlational method involves systematic uh, measuring the relationship between two or more variables. Uh, for example, how much uh, uh, one can be predicted from the other. The correlational coefficient is a statistic that assesses how well you can predict one variable from another. Correlational research assesses the direction and strength of the relationship between variables. Correlational research is designed to examine the nature of the relationship between two or more variables not controlled by the researcher. Correlations are used for prediction. If you know the value, a value of one variable, you can predict the value of the other. Correlational coefficient measures lin linear relationships between two variables. It ranges from plus or minus one. In other words, it starts off at minus one and it goes all the way to plus one. So it's, it, you, you, what you do is you plot where it is on that continuum between minus one and plus one. The more, it is, the more minus it is, the less the variables have any effect on each other. The more positive it is, the more that those two variables 
have on each other, the effect that they have on each other. So you can look at the, uh, the uh, correlational coefficient and you can tell how much one variable influences another variable. The closer to zero, the more there is no correlation between the two variables. Okay, so what, what you're looking for uh, is either a positive value or a negative value. Uh, the closer it is to zero, the, the less the two have to do with one another. Strength is indicated by magnitude, absolute value. Direction is indicated by the plus or minus sign. So if, if there is very little effect, it's a negative uh, re result. Let me give you an example from my own research. So when I looked at age, my correlational coefficient was close to zero. Whether you're, it's a male or female doesn't have anything to do with resilience. When I looked at education, surprise, surprise, it was close to zero. There, it didn't matter how much education someone had as to how strong their resilience was. When I looked at uh, age, I looked at resilience, I looked at gender, uh, what else am I looking at? Yeah, gender, age, and education were all really close to zero. My other two were close. Were, there, there was a result. Now, this is the fascinating part, <clears throat> or it was for me anyway. So I was looking at resilience, and I was looking at how strong um, uh, culture had to do, how, how, how much they knew about their own culture, how strong was that having to do with resilience. And this was a very positive number. This was a very strongly positive number. So culture had a lot to do with how resilient the individuals were. And we're talking about American Indians on the Northern Plains. Uh, and now, as far as, as trauma was concerned, trauma had very little to do with the more uh, trauma the individual had, had uh, experienced, uh, the, it, that didn't have anything to do with the resilience. So this was a strong negative number. Now the interesting thing is that when we look at other populations, such as uh, African Americans, we look at uh, uh, older individuals, we look at uh, uh, white uh, uh, people in the United States, uh, we look at Germans, uh, you, know, you can look at all, all different uh, Brazilians down in South America, uh, the more trauma they had, the less resilience they had. But American Indians, and this is we have seen this in three different studies, mine and two others, one on the Navajo Reservation, one on, on the Hopi Reservation. Uh, when we look at trauma, trauma has nothing to do with resilience. So the more trauma they've experienced doesn't, doesn't affect them. It affects other populations, but it doesn't seem to affect American Indians. This is one of the things that we have seen in some, in some of the research. So trauma has no effect. So it had a negative number, if that makes any sense. Okay, so the two things that we saw that, were, that, that, uh, that fit the hypothesis was that trauma had no effect on resilience, and, but culture did, had a very strong positive effect on resilience. So when we plotted, <clears throat> this is looking at aggression. So when we plotted, uh, when we plotted, plotted resilience and, and culture, we had a positive correlation. And this is the way our, uh, this is the way our, our graph looked. It looked, it was the, it was positive in this direction. No correlation, the age, education, gender, this is the way it looked. It was just all over the all over the place, but when we looked at trauma, it was this way. The, the line was this way. Negative correlations indicate uh, that an increase in one variable is associated with a decrease in the other, and that's exactly what we saw with trauma. Positive correlations indicate that an increase in one variable is associated with an increase in the other, and that's what we saw with culture and resilience. I say we, I. I was the one doing the research. Correlations at or near zero may mean no relationship between variables or, or a curvilinear uh, relationship. Social science correlations rarely exceed uh, 0.60 because most behavior is influenced by many variables, and this is what we saw. 
we saw a positive 6.60 with um, uh, uh, culture and resilience. We saw a negative 0 0.60 with trauma and resilience. When two variables are correlated, are related, correlated, there is a natural tendency to assume one causes the other. However, there are problems in assuming a cause. There's third, the third variable problem. It is very difficult to isolate only two variables. Reverse causality problem, which is ver which variable is the cause and which is the effect? Were they resilient and therefore they were that that's why they wanted to uh, to 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 uh, participate in the culture, or was it the culture that made them resilient? And the same way with trauma. The correlational uh, method identifies only whether two variables are associated and not why they are related. The correlational method often relies on surveys as well as an, on observational data. Surveys are used when the variable of interest is not easily observable. Surveys are structured sets of questions used to measure attitudes, beliefs, values, or behavioral tendencies. Four major survey techniques are face-to-face, -face, written, phone, and computer surveys. Format, delivery system, and question phrasing are aspects of a survey that must be carefully considered. The qualitative method investigates the way uh, and how of social science, not just what, where, and when. Hence, smaller but focused samples are more often used than large samples. If a researcher could find an instrument that quantified a feeling or idea, used a Likert or a Likert type scale, it is a quantitative research. Because of the lack of control of variable, variables, it is difficult to, imp to impossible to determine cause. All you see is effect. Observer, via, observer bias is a second problem. Preconceived ideas held by the researcher affects the nature of the observations made. The presence of an observer may change the behavior of the sample, and they may not act authentically, but in a manner they think the observer desires. There may be a question of invaded privacy also. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, the Milgram experiment. Wait a minute, let me see. How, oh, this is the last thing. Okay, the Milgram experiment. This is a videotape from the Milgram experiment. It's, it's, it's kind of long. In a unique period from the early 60s to the early 70s, a group of social scientists conducted a series of experiments right examining the nature of human behavior and its relationship to social conventions and situations. This is important. In this setting, I allow things to be done to me that I wouldn't allow in any other context. The dentist is about to put an electric drill into my mouth. That's no problem, I can. In this setting, I willingly expose my throat to a man with a razor blade. Stanley Milgram, one of the most influential social psychologists <laughs> of the time, was particularly fascinated with the dangers of group behavior and blind obedience to authority. Oh, look at the way he's walking. What he's is there in human nature? that allows an individual to act without any restraints whatsoever so that he can act uh, inhumanely, harshly, severely and in no way limited by feelings of compassion or conscience. These are quite... But he might be dead in there. The experiment requires that you continue, please. 330 volts. The experiments that Milgram and others conducted were controversial and, for ethical reasons, may never be conducted again. Yet, the results of those experiments remain groundbreaking, profoundly revealing about the tensions between the individual and society, and increasingly relevant to contemporary life. In 1962, Stanley Milgram shocked the world with his study on obedience. To test his theories, he invented an event that would become a window into human cruelty. In ascending order, a row of buttons marked the amount of voltage one person would inflict upon another. Milgram's original motive for the experiment was to understand the unthinkable, how the German people could permit the extermination of the Jews. 
When I learn of incidents such as the massacre of millions of men, women, and children perpetrated by the Nazis in World War II, how is it possible, I ask myself, that ordinary people, who are courteous and decent in everyday life, can act callously, inhumanely, without any limitations of conscience? Now, there are some studies in my discipline, social psychology, that seem to provide a clue to this question. I the problem I wanted to study was a little different, went a little bit further. It was the issue of authority. Under what conditions would a person obey authority who commanded actions that went against conscience? These are exactly the questions that I wanted to investigate at Yale University. It is May 1962. An experiment is being conducted in the Elegant Interaction Laboratory at Yale University. The subjects are 40 males between the ages of 20 and 50 residing in the greater New Haven area. Psychologists have developed several theories to explain how people learn. One theory is that people learn things correctly whenever they get punished for making a mistake. Forty years later, Milgram's infamous experiment, Obedience, is still taught in classrooms around the world. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Teacher. All right, now the next thing we'll have to do is set the... Uh, up so that he can get some sort of punishment. What inspired Milgram, I would say there were a number of factors. One of them is he was very ambitious. He wanted to make a mark in social psychology. And he wanted, as he wrote to one friend, he wanted to come up with the most, with the boldest experiment that he could think of. Would you roll up your right sleeve, please? This electrode is connected to the shock generator in the next room. And this electrode paste is to provide a good contact to avoid any blister or burn. Do you have any questions now before we go into the next room? About two years ago, I was at the Veterans Hospital in West Haven. Mm -hmm. And while there, they detected a heart condition. There's nothing serious. But as long as I'm having these shocks, um, how strong are they? How dangerous are they? Well, no. Although they may be painful, they're not dangerous. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, no, that's all. All right, teacher, would you take the test and be seated in front of the shock generator, please, in the next room? But the experiment was rigged. The victim was an accomplice of the experiment. The victim, according to plan, provided many wrong answers. His verbal responses were standardized on tape, and each protest was coordinated to a particular voltage level on the shock generator. Now, as teacher, you were seated in front of this impressive-looking instrument, the shock generator. Its essential feature is a line of switches that goes from 15 volts to 450 volts, and a set of verbal designations that goes from slight shock to moderate shock, strong shock, very strong shock, intense shock, extreme intensity shock, and finally XXX, danger severe shock. Your job, the experimenter explains to you, is the word pair test. If he gets each answer correctly, fine, you move on to the next pair. But if he makes a mistake, you are instructed to give him an electric shock, starting with 15 volts and you increase the shock one step on each error. Incorrect. You'll now get a shock of 105. Mm. Hard hit. Just how far can you go in this thing? As far as is necessary. What do you mean as far as is necessary? Milgram was very much aware that obedience is a necessary ingredient for society to function, but he focused on the darker side of obedience. Incorrect. 150 volts. Sad face. That's all. Get me out of here. I told you I had heart trouble. My heart's starting to bother me now. It's absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice, teacher. Oh, I have a lot of choices. My number one choice is that I wouldn't go on if I thought he was being harmed. Now, this man makes disobedience seem a very rational and simple deed. Now, other subjects respond quite differently to the experimenter's authority. Wrong. It's hair. 75 volts, Jim. You don't know. Please continue. Some psychologists were troubled by the ethics of it. Many, if not most, subjects found it a highly stressful, conflicted experience. People are stammering, stuttering, laughing hysterically and appropriately. 150 volts. Oh. Experiment. That's all. Get me out of here. He's I quit. Oh, my heart's starting to bother me now. Get me out of here, please. Let me out of here. You have no right to keep me here. Let me out. 
Let me out of here. Let me out. Continue, please. Let me out of here. My eyes bother me. Let Go me on. Out. Let me out. Clearly, you know, when we say people went to the top of the shock board, it wasn't like they were going blithely, sadistically. People went stop and go, stop and go. They were in a state of conflict, which was created a tremendous amount of stress. So that was the main critique. This will be at 3.30. As his voice began to show increasing frustration, uh, so did I. And I was really in a state of uh, real conflict and agitation. One of Stanley Milgram's basic contributions was that you don't ask people what they would do given this hypothetical situation. You put them in the situation. Wrong. Please continue, teacher. 180 volts. No! I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. Stand I'm not going to kill that man. Yeah. According to Milgram, one of the things that's a prerequisite for carrying out acts that are evil is to shed responsibility from your shoulders and, and hand it over to the person in charge. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one. Slow. He didn't hold any gun to anybody's head. Just the fact that he conveyed a sense of authority. Roughly 60, 65 percent of the people went all the way to the top of the shock board. 450 volts. That's it. Now continue using the last switch on the board, please. The 450 switch for each wrong answer. Continue, please. I'm not getting no answer. Don't the man's health mean anything? Whether the learner likes it or not, we but must. But he might be dead in there. Milgram made the point, I think, very effectively that the Nazis weren't all a bunch of psychopaths at Belsen and Dachau. Half a death camp from the middle class in New Haven. Well, who was actually pushing the switch? I was. But he kept insisting. I told him no, but he said he got to keep going. What kind of obedience would Milgram get today if he were to do the experiment today? Probably about the same. Probably about the same. Why? I don't know. I think people are just inherently obedient. It just really shows like how far human beings will go to appease what they perceive to be an authority figure. Milgram has identified one of the constants, one of the universals of social behavior. The readiness to obey authority cuts across time. It's a constant. The other outstanding and distinctive thing about the obedience experiment is how much it has and keeps on permeating contemporary culture and thought. It's still with us in very, very important ways. Okay, there you go. Wait a minute, let's get out of here. If you struggle to lose weight, yes, if you must struggle to lose weight. Questionable practices in, in research include deception, misinforming the participants about the uh, true nature of the research, and of course that's what Milgram is doing. This is done so that the response of the participant is closer to the real world, re world reactions. And a confederate, and he also used a confederate, using a trained member of the research team as part of the sample to deceive the participant to act in a certain way. And that is the end of today's lecture, I think. Yep, there we go. Okay, I'll see you guys next week.